thank you everyone for joining. My name is Nick Heaton. My lab is at Duke University. And what I'm going to talk to you about today are some genetic approaches that we've been taking to identify host factors we think that can be targeted uh, to prevent influenza virus disease. So if the goal is to better control influenza virus infection, there are really two ways that we can go about this. Uh, the first is to target the virus directly. And the second is to target um, something about the host cell um, so that the virus can no longer replicate. Now, in this first approach, this is, I think, probably most more intuitive to most people. This is what we've done historically, developed small molecules that inhibit viral enzymes or functionality of virus protein. So the virus just really can't replicate. Uh, Tamiflu or also Tamivir, for example, is a small molecule that inhibits the neuromidase protein of the virus, which is required for the virus to leave cells and go on to infect um, neighboring cells. The second approach is targeting the host cell. And this is, um, interest has increased in kind of this, this second option recently. And again, the idea is to change something about um, the host response, essentially leaving the virus alone uh, but making the host less permissive for infection. So again, different ways one can go about this. The first is to try and enhance the natural immune response to infection. So we recognize that cells already have ways to detect the virus and respond to that virus. And so one school of thought is that we simply just uh, might find ways to help the immune system just function a little better, and in this way, better control virus infection. The other approach is to directly prevent viral infection or replication in the actual target cells where the virus needs to replicate. And one can do this by eliminating a necessary host factor. So all viruses require um, co-opting proteins in the host cell to complete their replication cycle. So if you can find a host protein that is absolutely essential for the virus and get rid of that, now the virus can no longer replicate. Or alternatively, Cells can upregulate genes um, that encode for proteins that intrinsically restrict virus infection. Going back to this kind of immune uh, activation idea, a lot of these cytokines um, that are made after a cell detects virus infection talk to neighboring cells, tell them to turn on these genes. And if these genes are turned on before it's exposed to a virus, that cell is now non-permissive for infection. And so at least at a high level, uh, these various options are at least theoretical approaches for ways um, that influenza virus could be controlled. And we've been interested in the you know, host side of things. And what I'm going to tell you about today are two kind of shorter stories uh, that relate to enhancing the immune response to infection or identifying virus restriction factors. And I'm going to start with the restriction factor story. So for any host-directed therapeutic um, the first thing you have to have is the target. What is the actual host protein that you want to change expression of? And so to find those targets, we and many other groups have taken high throughput genetic approaches uh, to identify such, such factors. And, and one approach that can be used is CRISPR-Cas9 based technology. I think most people are more aware of the technology in the context of knocking out genes, which I've diagrammed here on the left. And essentially how this works is a catalytically active Cas9 protein can be targeted to a specific genomic locus by virtue of the sequence of the uh, guide RNA. And when this is targeted to an exon, Cas9 can make a cut in the DNA, a double strand break, which the host cell then fixes imperfectly and frequently leads to frame shifts um, and the knockout of that protein. And so you can do screens with this technology and what that gives you um, are the factors that are necessary for viral replication. When they're lost, the virus can no longer replicate. But a slight permutation of that technology uh, I'm showing here on the right, and this is called DCAS9 activation, which again is using Cas9 protein, but now Cas9 is catalytically inactive, can no longer cut DNA. The guide RNA still targets it to a locus, but now it's targeting it to promoters instead of the middle of the gene. And finally, and importantly, Cas9 and the RNA uh, work in such a way that transcriptional activators are, are dragged to these promoters. And it actually turns on genes. It actually increases expression rather than knocking them out. 
what you get when you use that kind of technology are factors that are sufficient for viral control. Um, factors that all by themselves are able to stop viral infection. And uh, the, the two stories I'm going to tell you about today are using that technology. Now, we wanted to find uh, cellular factors that when they were upregulated would make the cell completely resistant to infection. So we decided to use a reporter system, which I've diagrammed here on the left. So instead of just taking regular cells and infecting them with a the virus and seeing um, you know, what cells live and which cells die, we integrated this transgenic cassette, which is a promoter followed by a lock stop lock cassette and then a green fluorescent protein. And we use that particular reporter because we have an influenza virus that expresses Cre recombinase. And Cre recombinase is a protein that binds those locks P sites and removes the stop cassette. So after viral infection, the cells turn green. And the reason that we used this system was because that's a very sensitive way to label any cell that's ever seen infection. Very little virally expressed Cre has to be expressed for these cells to turn green. So that gives us some different potential outcomes of infected. All the infected cells turn green. If the cells get infected and die, they're gone. We don't even see them. Uh, but for the cells that are still there, the ones that aren't infected or never got infected even a little bit are not green compared to those uh, which may have had an abortive infection or something like this. This is a system we want to use. We want to identify these cells that didn't get any infection, the not green ones. And I have some data here showing you that this system works. Uh, this is flow cytometry. It's green fluorescence on the x-axis. If we infect with an unmodified virus that doesn't have Cre, there's no reporter expression. But if we infect with our Cre expressing virus, you can see by 24 hours, um, the cells turn bright green. So that's the system that we use. The screen we actually did is shown here. So it's these guide RNAs that tell Cas9 where to go and what gene uh, to activate. So we use a huge library of these guide RNAs. It has three specific sequences for every OR for open reading frame in the human genome. And the screen is shown here at the bottom or in the uh, underneath those, those words. We take a bunch of cells and we deliver the guide RNAs in such a way that each cell only gets one guide RNA. So after that happens, what you get are a population of cells where every cell in the dish is upregulating a different gene. Then we put on the virus and basically let the virus kill any cells that it can, right? If a gene is being upregulated, it doesn't matter with respect to virus infection. That cell just dies and is eliminated from the population. After the virus is done killing all the cells it can, we collect the remaining cells and sort them, right? We sort out the green ones from the not green ones now. And then we sequence them. We sequence those guide RNAs to see what was enriched, and we compare that to what was there prior to putting the virus on. When you do a screen, we do it in replicates. And what I hope you can appreciate, these are graphs that are showing um, basically the abundance of different guide RNAs. And you can see that we strongly enrich for a small subset of these guide RNAs. But what are these guide RNAs targeting? So we can do um, bioinformatic analysis and see which genes are predicted to be upregulated. And in this particular plot, the size and the height of the dot corresponding to every gene in the genome um, shows how abundant they were in our sequencing. So you can see along the x-axis here that most of the genes are not important at all. There's a few genes which are a little bit important, uh, but then clearly in red here at the top, this gene B4-gallant2 is by far the most enriched in our screen. For those cells that became resistant to the virus and were not green at all, um, this is the most abundant um, guide RNA. So the first thing we have to do is test that, right? This is still just a prediction. So the first thing we do is um, do a Western blot. Uh, at least on my screen, the beta actin control is not, it's not displaying, but you have to take my word for it. There's equal loading, and you can see that uh, when we put in the guide RNA targeting B4 gamut 2, we actually see uh, upregulation of that gene. And then we can go ahead and infect these cells. We made two different cell lines, which are overexpressing B4 gallon 2 compared to a control. You can see that in control here, we're just infecting with a GFP expressing virus, so that's a direct measurement of infection. The control cells get infected while the B4 gallon 2 overexpressing cells uh, are able to prevent that virus infection. 
So it looks like this is a good hit. This looks like um, it's a real restriction factor of the virus. So what is B4 gallon 2 and what does it do? What's well, a glycosyl transferase, which basically adds sugars um, to a glycan. So for those of you that aren't glycobiologists, I made you a, a cartoon here. So glycans are basically chains of sugars that are added to the top of glycoproteins um, through a, as they go through the secretory pathway. So this glycan here, like where it ends on the bottom, that little black line, that's where it would be attached to the protein, which would then be attached to the cell. And these sugars, um, the, the overall glycan can be composed of different sugars, which I gave you a little key on the bottom of the slide there. So with respect to flu infection, the sugar that's really important is this little purple diamond on the top. That's the viral receptor. That's the sialic acid moiety. And what B4 gallant 2 is known to do is this. It takes sialic acid containing glycan and it adds a galnac to the subterminal galactose so that now this sialic acid has a neighbor. But the sialic acid is still there. So why wouldn't the virus be able to use this as a receptor? That, that became our next question. <laughs> It's possible, our first thought was that it was possible that this isn't a gene that's normally expressed in lung cells and we're expressing it to a high level. So maybe under those conditions, it just does something different than we would expect it to do. So we can see if that's the case um, by collecting the glycans from the surface of cells, doing HPLC and performing mass spec, which I'm showing you a representation of that data here. So on the top is the um, that can, are glycans from control cells. This is normal, and I know it's small, but hopefully you can make out that these glycans look basically like the cartoon that I showed you in the previous slide, and these little sialic acids are all out there on the surface. When we do the same analysis for V4 gallon 2 expressing cells, um, again, just what we expect, there's these little neighbors, um, these galnacs next to the sialic acid, but we don't see any modifications that are anything different. So it looks like it's the normal modification of B4 gallon 2. That somehow, even though the sialic acid is there, the receptor is still there, we can't find it. So we decided to study a little bit, look a little bit closer at why proteins couldn't recognize sialic acids. Proteins that normally bind sialic acids now cannot do so. So the viral hemagglutinin, that's the receptor binding protein, binds sialic acids. But there's lots of proteins that uh, bind sugars. They're, they're broadly called lectins. And wheat germagglutinin, which is abbreviated here WGA, is one that broadly binds sialic acids. So we use this um, protein. It's fluorescently labeled, so green signal is what it's binding. You can see that in control cells on the left, um, they're all bound by wheat germagglutinin. And on the right, that binding goes way down. So it seems like it's not a flu-specific thing. Proteins in general that recognize sialic acids have a hard time doing so after B4 gallon 2 has added this extra sugar. But sialic acids can be attached to the subterminal galactose via different chemistries. One's called an alpha 2 3 linked sialic acid linkage, and one's called an alpha 2 6 linkage. So we decided to look a little more in depth if there was any differences, um, you know, kind of in lectins with different specificities. So what I'm showing you are histograms from flow cytometry analysis. And the first one I'm showing you is wheat germagglutinin, which I showed you in the microscopy pictures right above. You can see that when we have B4 gallon 2 overexpressing, which is in the green, we get less binding. Now, when we use lectins that are specific for sialic acids with different linkages, for example, the 2 3 linkage, you can see that that is significantly decreased as well. Uh, but interestingly, when we look at the 2 6 linkage, uh, sialic acid with, with preference for the 2,6 linked sialic acid, we don't see any difference. And this is potentially a problem if we're talking about restriction of influenza viruses, because different strains of influenza viruses use sialic acids that are linked to that subterminal galactose in different ways. So influenza viruses have a large host range. Um, they infect birds, which I'm going to talk about here in humans. And the bird strains prefer this alpha 2 3 linked sialic acid as a receptor, while the human strains prefer alpha 2 6 linked uh, sialic acid as a receptor. So, our mass spec before didn't distinguish 
between which of these uh, which of these glycans with different linkages between that galactose and sialic acid would be modified by B4 gamma 2. But we can do exactly that analysis called a glycan linkage analysis. And our lectins would predict we only affect the two three containing um, glycans, the bird glycans. When we do the analysis, that's exactly what we see. Two six linked sialic acids um, are not modified, only two threes. And this actually makes sense if we go back and we think about the virus we used for the screen. We use a laboratory adapted H1N1 virus uh, called PR8, which was initially isolated from people or from a person, but has been passaged in chicken eggs since the 1930s and has acquired a preference for this particular linkage. So these data all suggest that we would strongly restrict avian viruses, but not human strains of viruses. And so we decided to test that. What I'm showing here is a crystal violet staining assay where we're basically putting on virus at different dilutions. And if the cells are killed, they float away and crystal violet won't stain. So if the cells have been killed, um, you have these clear wells. Well, if the cells are still there, you have these dark, um, they're black and white, but they would be purple wells. So in mock infected on the top left, there's no virus, all the cells are there. And when we infect with and H7N2 avian virus, you can see we kill the control cells much more than the B4 gallant 2 overexpressing cells. That trend holds true for H9N2 viruses or H5N9 viruses or H10N4. Basically, any avian virus that we put on B4 gallant 2 expressing cells, they're strongly restricted. Um, which, you know, again, makes sense. I'm not going to show you the data, but when we repeat this analysis with human viruses, the ones that like the alpha 2 3 link sialic acid, we don't see any significant inhibition. So we're only part of the way there. Avian viruses cause severe disease in people when they're exposed, high, highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses. Um, and so now, B4 gallon 2 is potentially a host factor that we could target to restrict those viruses. But we really want to find host targets that would block infection in a strain-independent manner, something that would get all strains of this. So what is a kind of pan-viral um, process that we could potentially target? And here we returned back to this idea of the immune system, because uh, the immune system restricts influenza viruses similarly irrespective of their uh, receptor usage. And in particular, I'm going to highlight the interferon response Type 1 interferon is one of these inflammatory cytokines that is made when an infected cell detects that infection. It initiates what's called JAK-STAT signaling and turns on interferon-stimulated genes, or ISGs, and these proteins have antiviral activity. So that antiviral activity is what restricts the virus. But in addition to that, um, interferon also turns on negative regulators of this signaling, which limits, ultimately, um, the kind of magnitude of the antiviral activity. So if this is the model, if type 1 interferon induces both negative regulators and the interferon stimulated genes that have antiviral activity, those neg negative regulators restrict these ISGs. Maybe if we figure out what these negative regulators are and remove them, we could induce interferon stimulated genes to a higher level, have higher antiviral activity and basically help the immune system function a little better with respect to controlling these viruses. Again, the question is, what should we be targeting? So we need a readout for interferon response. We made um, the construct, which is shown here. I'm not going to go into the details other than to say, in the promoter, we have these interferon-sensitive response elements, or ISREs. And this is, what, this is where transcription factors bind after they are um, induced by interferon signaling, and then we induce a variant of GFP that makes the cells turn green, and it works. If we add interferon, the cells turn bright green. So we want to find negative regulators, and the screen we did um, to find them is diagrammed here. Again, we take a large number of cells. We introduce the guide RNAs, so we're turning on one gene in every cell. We collect some of them to know where we started from. We treat the rest of the cells with interferon, and the vast majority of them turned green. We collect them for uh, sorting. But what we're collecting is not the green ones. We're collecting the ones that aren't green. 
cells that have upregulated a negative regulator of interferon so strongly that the cell that now fails to respond to interferon. We take those GFP negative cells and sequence the guide RNAs that are in them compared to what we started with. And after bioinformatic analysis and a bunch of um, filters that I won't go into today for the sake of time, we got to three hits. C1.1 ETB7 and up 153. They, when overexpressed by themselves, are sufficient to decrease that interferon response, at least as read out by that reporter. Um, at least ETB7 and up 153 don't affect GFP by itself. It's specific for the interferon response, and we decide to focus on ETB7. It's known to be an interferon stimulated gene. Um, and it's a DNA binding transcription factor, but it had no known role in the regulation of interferon signaling. So we decided to study that further. Again, our validation to this point has been limited to our reporter, which is still an artificial system. So does it affect the real interferon response and suppress real ISGs? This is um, a, a qPCR assay for RNA levels. So we're adding interferon in the control cell we're getting interferon stimulated genes here. I'm just showing you two representative ones. When ETB7 is being overexpressed, you can see the magnitude of that response is significantly decreased. Uh, you can make that out of the protein level here on the right. When ETB7 is there uh, in the presence of interferon, um, interferon stimulated genes are upregulated to a much smaller extent. The reciprocal is also true. If we knock out this negative regulator, now the RNA levels for representative ISGs go up more than control, uh, and the protein level shows the same trend. In the knockout cells, you get more ISGs than in control cells. So how is it working? I told you these ISREs are the sites in DNA that uh, basically allow the specific interferon-induced transcription factors to turn on gene expression. ETB7 is a transcription factor. We know the sequence that it likes to bind in, in terms of DNA. And that I'm showing you here on the bottom, GGAA is the central motif that ETB7 uses to bind to its sites. So if you look at the consensus sequence of ISREs, there's two spots that could be ETB7 binding sites, um, depending on what that N is. So if we look at the promoters of real ISGs and say, do we ever get a GGAA? Um, here are some example ISGs on the right. And you can see in most of their promoters, they do indeed have a GGAA in their um, kind of I, their canonical ISRE sequence. But not all, which led us to this idea that while ETV7 may be a repressor of interferon stimulated genes, it will probably affect different ISGs to a different extent based on the specific sequence in their promoters. So to test that, we did RNA sequencing. I'm uh, showing you a heat map on the right. m cherry is the control. ETB7 is the negative regulator. If we add interferon, you can see that the control cell genes, uh, the expression of ISGs all goes up. Uh, orange is up in this case, and ETV7 broadly restricts that. But if you look towards the bottom of the heat map, there are some ISGs that are only modestly affected, com affected compared to at the top, the ones that are strongly affected. So it does seem like it has differential responses. We learned a little more about its action. If we go back to our reporter, the initial construct that we have, the ISREs all have ETV7 binding sites, this GGAA which probably explains why we pulled it out in our screen, but we can modify that so that those sites are all still ISREs but don't have ETV7 binding sites. And when we do that, compared to the, um, the interferon reporter that we started with, which is on the left side of that graph, where ETV7 is mediating effect, the non-ETV7 binding site version of it still responds to interferon, but now ETV7 has no effect. To show that it's directly binding that sequence, uh, we did an oligo-based IP where essentially we took a biotinylated oligo, which either has an ISRE with an ETB7 binding site here, this is an ISRE from ISG15, or a mutant where we've changed one position so it's no longer a uh, ETB7 consensus binding site. When we take these oligos and go fishing in cell life states, you can see that we pull down ETB7 with the wild type, but not the mutant ISRE. 
So to basically sum up this part quickly, we think that ETB7 works by competitively binding these ISRE sites and preventing the normal activating transcription factors from binding. That's how it suppresses the interferon response. But again, back to our goal, we were trying to find negative regulators that we could remove to increase activity against influenza viruses. And if you look at this list on the right um, of genes that are affected by ETB7, a lot of them have activity against influenza viruses. So if we go back to our model now, kind of generic negative regulators been replaced with ETB7. It's blocking these ISGs that have antiviral activity. If we get rid of it, we should get more ISGs, better control of virus. And that's indeed what we see. Here we're taking a virus, we're doing a multi-cycle growth curve. And the virus grows much more poorly on the knockout cells compared to the control because these knockout cells are detecting the virus and responding better than the control cells, which are being which are having their interferon response suppressed by ETB7. This is what it actually looks like um, in terms of kind of green signal. We're infecting with a green virus. The control cell, the virus is spreading across the plate. You're getting green signal compared to the knockout cells uh, where these cells are now responding particularly well to infection. Um, and it doesn't just happen with this strain. Other strains of influenza A, um, like California 09 or an influenza B virus, uh, Malaysia 04, they're both restricted. So it seems like we've accomplished our goal here of finding a host factor um, that can broadly restrict influenza virus. Now, some of you uh, may be thinking <laughs> what I'm about to say now, and um, what I want to leave you with is kind of this idea of how, how can we potentially use one of these uh, host factors. Clinically, if we were modulating ETB7, is this something that we want to do? And again, the question here is severe influenza disease, people who die from flu, it's associated with hyperinflammation. So would we really want to suppress a negative regulator of inflammation to control the virus? And I think the answer is probably not in all cases, but we can envision some cases where we think it would be helpful. For example, as a prophylactic treatment for people at high risk or people that are exposed, Right here, I have diagrammed five people. One has the virus. You probably wouldn't want to treat that person. But for people that are in close contact, suppressing ETV7 such that their initial response to the virus right away, as soon as they're exposed, works better. You could potentially head off virus infection, not, a, not let it establish um, you know, severe disease in the first place. We could see a modulator working in that context. Additionally, there are some people which are infected with the virus that clinically it's been decided they actually should be treated with interferon, that the interferon response would be helpful. And obviously in that case, potentiating that therapy by suppressing interferon, so, or suppressing ETB7 so that interferon works better um, is potentially a useful uh, approach for, uh, you know, for an ETB7 targeting therapy. Okay, so to wrap up, Non-traditional antiviral proteins, such as b 4 gamma 2 can be identified with high-throughput screening. The beginning, I talked to you about this protein that modifies the host receptor that prevents virus binding, although the sialic acid isn't directly modified. However, because it's specific for only some of these glycans, it's a strong restrictor of avian influenza viruses, but not human influenza viruses. We also identified a host immune response modulator that helps restrict the spread of influenza viruses. Uh, it limits all strains that we've tested. Um, and an important point I think to highlight is that in addition to influenza viruses, other pathogens are controlled by type one interferon. And so this type of targeting may have broad efficacy. And our current and future work really, I mean, we're continuing to identify most more host targets, um, but that only gets you part of the way there, right? We need ways to safely and transiently upregulate and downregulate these factors to actually um, you know, move them into the clinic and actually treat people with them. The last slide I'll show you is the most important slide the people who actually did the work. The ETV7 work was primarily done by Heather with some help from Ryan. The uh, B4 Gamma 2 work was done primarily by Brooke with some help from Al. We have some great collaborators uh, inside and outside of Duke and were funded um, um, you know, by these various sources, we're, we're very lucky to have this funding and be able to do this type of work. I will wrap up now. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to contact me.
um, thank you for your attention.